The router is one of my favorite tools, and I think for most woodworkers, it's one of theirs too. It doesn't take much to put just that perfect edge in a project to provide an awful lot more creativity than it would have had without using the router. The issue is how to use them and some of the tricks to using them, and I want to show you not only the setups, but some of the interesting things that can be done with them. One of the first things we'll talk about is bit insertion. It may seem a little mundane to you, but I think a lot of people can benefit by this. Um, when I put a bit in, now I can take the base off here. I normally don't do that, but it makes it a little bit easier for you to see. I'll slide the bit in, and instead of using a spindle lock and a single wrench, I want to use two wrenches. I find that sometimes that spindle lock and one wrench provides for a little bit too much tightening on the collet, and, and there's nothing worse than that. Once you've crushed a collet and ruined its dimensions inside, the only way to fix that is unfortunately to get a new collet. So by using two wrenches, one on the bottom and one on the top here, I can put these collet nuts together, and once I get them firm, just by using the pressure of squeeze in my hand, I put plenty of tension on that bit to hold it in the router. That's more than enough tension. When I will go to take that bit out, by reversing those and squeezing them the opposite way, I can now release tension much easier than it is to try and do that with a single wrench. So now let's talk about a couple of ways to set the bit height. I've already inserted the bit, and depending upon the project or the application, of course, we want to set the bit to that height. First, here's a hinge. Uh, if you were planning on cutting a small little recess for this hinge plate to fit in, by taking the actual hinge plate and setting it on the base of the router, I can now lower the base, raising the bit, until it's even with the top of that plate. And then locking that in means that the recess that I'm cutting will be exactly the same depth as the plate that I've set it to. Second thing we can do is take a predetermined depth on a piece of wood. Same idea, where we're going to lower or raise that bit. to that new depth, like this. And that could be done on any type of profile bit. So whether or not you've got an OG or a roundover, same process can, can hold true for that. Now the last way to do this is to set the router on a flat surface. What I'll do is I'll lower that bit until it just touches the surface, in this case of the workbench. And there we are right there. I know that that's the zero. So if I take this index and I move it to match up with the line on the router. Now everybody's router is a little bit different. You'll have different scales, but the idea is zeroing this out first. Once I've set that, if I want to raise that bit just by turning the handle, I know exactly how much I'm raising it. So there's a 64th. There's a 32nd, and you can see now that the base is beginning to come off the table. We're actually lowering it exactly based on the indications on that scale. So it makes it really easy to set an exact dimension working from the bottom up in this case. So those are a couple of different ways to set bit height. So the next issue is bit speed. Generally speaking, we want the outside radius, the outside edge of each cutting bit, to be traveling at about the same speed regardless of its diameter. So usually what we'll have is bits that are less than a quarter of an inch in diameter can travel up to 24,000 RPM, which is the top speed in most routers. And as that bit diameter grows, the speed needs to get slower so that the outside radius is traveling at about that original RPM or that speed. To accomplish that, bits less than one inch in diameter can run at speeds up to 24,000 RPM. That's the top speed in most routers and a one and a quarter to two inch diameter bit should run at about 18,000 RPM or less. A two and a quarter to two and a half inch bit should run at about 16,000 RPM or less, and bits three inches and larger should run at about 12,000 RPM or less. Now, some manufacturers will produce router bits that have an enclosed speed chart. They've already done some of the calculations and they base those on their bit, the trajectory and the diameter of that bit, and how well it cuts to provide the best speed, the best handling, and the cleanest cut. So I would definitely follow those recommendations. When routing, it's important to know what direction to route in. On a handheld router, I'm going to be routing from left to right. In doing that, you're routing into the direction of the cutter, 
It's keeping the router on the wood and up against the wood, providing a lot more control and a much cleaner cut. When I move to the router table, what we're doing is inverting the router. We're just turning it upside down. So in this case, I'm going to route from right to left. The same routing operation, just so we've changed the position of the router. So let's make a pass and you'll kind of watch and see how that router tracks, both from a handheld standpoint and one from a router table. while I was routing left to right with a handheld router, and then that inverted router in the table and routing right to left, you may have noticed my feed speed. It's the speed at which the board passes over the bit or, or you pass the bit over the board. And it's kind of an acquired skill. You don't want the bit to freewheel. You don't want to sit in one spot for any length of time because that'll generate a lot of friction. That friction goes to heat and that'll equate to a burn. Secondly, you don't want the motor to bog trying to push the material through too fast with too thick a material or a real involved router bit. So that feed speed rate is something that you're going to get to after a while, the longer you've routed. Let me show you a couple of things in the router. You'll be able to hear the difference between going too fast and too slow, and then finally what it looks like to do the correct speed. Now as I start routing, I'm actually routing pretty slow really not going to hear any real differences in the sound of that router bit. It's pretty much freewheeling. Now here I'm routing a lot faster, in fact much faster than it should be. And you should be able to pick up a little chunk as a piece of wood got removed from there. Again, way too fast to pass. and now you're hearing a nice, slow, even press. You should hear the bit working at about the same revolutions and same sound all the way through. It's a speed somewhere between too fast and too slow, and the resulting edge is really clean. When you run too slow, you'll find areas where the bit's been sitting in one spot, and you may notice a burn mark. They're pretty slight here, but they're definitely in there. As you look a little further down the board, that faster feed speed was actually tearing material out. Really didn't even get a chance to cut it. And you'll see in this spot, there's an actual little chunk out of here. As far as I'm concerned, that would have ruined that pass. Now when I was routing those profiles a little bit earlier, the bit that I was using is called an OG bit. It's got a small bearing on the end of it like this. The nice part about that is the bearing kind of controls the, the pass and the depth of that bit. And it really doesn't make any difference whether or not the wood is riding a little high or low on it because you can always resend a piece through there without a real problem. The issue comes in when you're using some bits with a profile that only allow that cut one time, so it's a single time pass on it, and it's got to stay in the same plane the entire time. So I'm talking about rail and style and those kind of things, or in this case, what we've got is a slot cutter. I've got that set to cut to about the middle of the board. If I don't use something like this, this is a hold down, this is a hold in, that board then could kind of ride the waves in effect and put that slot in any particular spot all along the length. But having a hold down like this on the top and a hold in like this will allow that board to track in only one direction in the same plane and we'll get a nice clean, well indexed cut all the way through. I'm going to turn this on and run it and you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. So that board tracked perfectly. As it went through, it kept that bit right in the middle of the cut where it was supposed to be and made the same line all the way through. So we have the same thickness on one side as we have on the other. 
And again, that's because we used a hold down and a hold in. Now they come with some router tables. They don't come with all of them. You can buy them as an aftermarket. You can even make them. But the idea is to use them, especially on bits that only allow that single pass in a single plane. Up until now, we've been showing almost everything that's considered edge guiding. Uh, it's done with a router bit with a small bearing or used on a router table. But in general, all the profiles are done on the outside edge of a project or a piece. What I wanted to do is show you how to route what they call field routing. That's the part that's inside the edges. Now that can't be done with a router bit with a bearing on it. There's no way to get it inside there. And one of the best ways to do it, outside of making a couple of rails that your router can run in, is to actually make a small little edge guide like this. Uh, most routers don't come with them as a matter of stock. Uh, you can order them as aftermarket. But there's some great projects. Uh, this is one from the magazine that I think that you'd enjoy using that allows you to route on the inside edges. And I'll show you how that goes. I've got a cove bit inside here. This is a plunge router. I'm going to start, push the bit in, and move it this way. It'll be controlled by this edge guide. And you see what we're doing is running on the middle. And you can make as many of those as short or as long as you want. But the idea is the edge guide. So here's how this works. Now here's your perfect groove down the inside of a board. And again, we can do multiples of these, all done with a simple edge guide and a bit that provides a kind of a unique profile. And they're all different kind of bits available, but the idea is using an edge guide, making one and using one, I think is a good skill to learn. Setting the fence in a router table is really pretty easy, especially when you're using a bit like this with a bearing on it. The idea is you want the face of this bearing to be even with the face of this router table fence. So the idea is I will just use a straight edge and as long as I line the straight edge on the fence and make sure that once I move the fence and that straight edge then just touches the face of that bearing, I can now lock the fence in that position. It's perfect. What you don't want is you don't want that bearing out ahead because the wood's going to have to climb around both the in-feed and outside outfeed fences and you certainly don't want it behind here where it can actually get stuck back there. So moving it even and using a straight edge like this makes that adjustment pretty easy. There are some bits, though, that don't make it that easy when you're trying to set the fence to them. And a lot of these are specialty bits. Uh, for setting the fence position in relation to some of these bits, this particular one is called a drawer lock. I would suggest that you look at the manufacturer's recommendations. They have a couple of systems and a couple of techniques that allow you to set that fence in relation to their bit. But in general, and most of the bits you're going to be using have a bearing on them like you see here. Using a straight edge like this up against the fence allows a perfect alignment of that bit with the straight edge. Now there are instances when using the full diameter or size of that bit when you're going to be taking off just way too much material at one time. So taking multiple passes is a much better bet. Much easier on the machine to start with and provides a much better cut. And there's a couple of ways to do that on the router table. And I'd like to show you both of them. The first one, in a router bit that allows for it, and what I'm saying is that the router bit's profile will make, make that easy, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. I'm going to start with the bit relatively low, and I'm going to make one pass. Then I'll raise the bit, make a second pass, and maybe on my third pass, make the full profile. And you'll see as the bit does that, it's cutting a deeper and deeper profile and allows for a much easier pass on each one. Now the caution here is that if you're going to do this with any large project, Make sure that you do it with the entire length of all of your stock first, plus a little bit extra, because if you make a mistake, good luck going back and trying to repeat that initial depth. So here's that first method made for a really wild, deep pass on the final one, but the initial passes were a little bit smaller, provides a really beautiful edge on this that you probably wouldn't have gotten had you tried to do that all in one fell swoop. 
Now the second way to do this, and we'll use the same bit just for uh, speed's sake, but what we're going to do in this case is we're actually going to move the fence. So we'll start with the fence a little bit forward of that bit in its full profile. So we still want that profile when we're done. But what we're going to do is slide this fence forward. So we'll start at the outside edge and we'll work our way back. And again, there are some bits that that's the only way that you can do this because that profile doesn't allow itself to be cut in raising it. It's got to be coming from behind. So you'll see what we're talking about here. So here we are, same profile, cut two different ways, awful deep to have cut in one, but either by moving the fence as we did on this side or raising the bit on this side, we wind up with the same profile. Pretty interesting way to do it. Now that's done on the router table. We can do the same type of thing on a handheld router. Let me show you how to do that. Now in general with a handheld router, no bit has any real advantage in moving into the wood as opposed to just lowering the bit. So what we're going to do here, and it's easier, is to lower the bit and do that in multiple passes. So I'm going to start with the router, I'm going to make one pass, lower the bit, send it through a second time, and then finally do it a third time. So we're accomplishing the same thing. We're still trying to set this up as a multiple pass thing, but instead of moving the bit into the wood, we're just lowering it. So here what we've got is a beautiful, deep, clean pass done in multiple passes. So we started out here a little bit lighter, second pass was a little bit deeper, and here's our third pass, and the result is a really nice clean edge and a very clean profile. So that's a way to make multiple passes using a handheld router. What you've seen the entire time we've been talking today is routing in the correct router direction. Handheld router left to right, router table right to left. But there are those times, depending upon the wood species or the type of cut that you're making, that when routing left to right with a handheld router, you're getting an awful lot of chip out. You can try multiple passes and that occasionally works. But one of the ways that will almost always work is what's called climb routing. And in that case, instead of routing left to right with a handheld router, we're routing right to left. Now what's happening with that is the router bit is running over the back side of that wood. It's not cutting into it. So the router is going to kind of freewheel a little bit. It's going to be a little bit loose. But you're holding the router and you need to know that that's what's going to happen. What you'll find when you're doing that is that by routing over the back side, in effect you're all but scraping that wood away, which should generally eliminate any chip out. Now what I generally find is that the first pass I make, the bearing is not pushing up against the wood and it's not going to cut quite a straight line. It feels a little bit irritating. But once you set it on there and make your second pass, maybe even your third one as a climb route, you're going to find it routes perfectly. And a lot of people then will finish by just doing one pass correctly left to right just to pick up any of that little fuzz that winds up after you're done routing. But the idea is called climb routing. You'll read about it. You need to know what it does. Just understand that the router is going to feel a lot different when you're doing it that direction. So let's do this. I can probably tell as I was routing, especially as I got close to the end, just seemed to kind of run every once in a while. And again, that's because it's running over the back of that router bit. But boy, the edge is really clean. 
It's really smooth, and it is one way to kind of take care of chip out if every other way fails. Again, called climb routing. It's a good skill to learn, but it's something to use a lot of caution when you're doing. One thing that plagues most woodworkers, especially when they're routing, is burnt edges. If you've been routing cherry, you've all seen it. You've either browned that edge or you've burnt it. Cherry has a little bit of sap in it, and a lot of times that sap heats up pretty quickly and winds up burning. The issue is that sometimes it's really hard to avoid it, so you've got to learn to deal with it when it happens. So I worked on it for a little while here to try and burn an edge on this piece of wood, and I want to show you, or at least explain to you, a couple different ways to get that, that burn out. And the one that I found is kind of interesting. Um, you, you'll see how well that works. But let's just say you've routed an entire piece, you're ready to join this thing up, or maybe you've already put it together, and you notice a little burn mark midway through. There's no way to now trim that edge. There's no way to go back and do anything with it. And what I'm hoping you won't do is sand it. Uh, if you go to sand some of these profile edges, you ruin that real nice crisp edge. But there is a little trick to getting away with um, doing something after the fact. I've got a slightly burned edge here. I'm going to take a wet paper towel. Maybe a Q-tip would work pretty well. Burned edge pretty shows up pretty well here. And if I know that this bit is the thing that created that profile, in effect, this is the perfect scraper for removing the burnt edge that was on there. So if I use this, normally I'd let it dry just a little bit more, and use this and kind of pull it across that profile, I can actually take that burn mark right out of there without doing any sanding. It actually works really well. And it's sometimes a lifesaver when right in the middle of a project you notice something you want to fix. Um, this works really well. It's a great tip something that you may want to use. Hopefully you won't have to, but at least you'll know that it's there.